Um, now, what happens if I don't have a graph to look at? What if I don't have a picture that I can see that shows me what's happening as the uh, function runs through its domain? Um, well, we're going to look at this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we're going to use, uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to use my graphing calculator to solve the problem of the limit of this function as x approaches 1. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and you know, on on the one hand, I could draw this graph. You know, that's a lot of work. It's not a very simple function to analyze. In fact, uh, how would I actually draw this graph from scratch if I didn't really have anything else to go on? Uh, well, we're going to learn later on how to do this, but it involves calculus, right? The way that the, the most efficient way to reconstruct uh, a function's graph is through analysis of its properties through calculus. But at this point, how can I determine the value of this limit? Um, well, number one, the first thing I would do, the first thing I always do, is a direct evaluation. What happens if I replace a variable with the limit point? Yeah. Well, what happens, uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and always, uh, because if it is, if you do get a real number as a solution, then uh, in the typical case, you're done. So by direct evaluation, uh, what do I get? Uh, 1 to the 5th minus 1 divided by 1 cubed minus 1. Uh, what is that? 0 over 0. So what do you say about this number? What does that equal? What does that equal? If, if it equals 0, we're done. What do we say about this number? Undefined. Any number that has zero in the denominator is undefined. Zero is not a divisor in the real number system. So uh, again, if this had been equal to a real number, then there wouldn't really be anything to do. I'd be done. Um, but this does not equal a real number. Division by zero is not defined under any case. Okay, so that means I can't do this by direct evaluation. I don't have the picture to look at. How do I solve the problem? Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up, a, I'm going to uh, arrange a little test here that's going to allow me to solve this problem. Uh, I'm going to look at the number line about the point one, and I'm going to construct a couple of paths, one from the left, one from the right, that will allow me to approach the function, the limit point in an efficient way. Um, so I'm going to do it like this. Here's my number line. Let it be blue. Here's my number line. Here's my point one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a point a little bit to the left of one, and the, uh, and then one to the right, and then I'm going to make a, a, a progression from that point, and I'm going to get closer and closer. I'm going to do it this way, and this is the way. This is the most efficient way to do it. I'll start maybe right here. Maybe this is the point 1.1. One point one. So I'm going to start a tenth of a unit away from the point. Okay. Now I'm going to move a little bit closer. Now I'm going to move within a hundredth of a unit. So starting from a tenth of a unit away, I'm going to move in to with one one hundredth of a unit, 1.01. 1 .01. And now I'll do one more. I'll get even closer. I'll move within a thousandth of a unit. So this point here, 1.001. 1 .001. So here's a numerical illustration of that process of approaching the limit point. Again, it's a process. No single evaluation along this path is sufficient to establish the value of the limit, but the behavior of these function values as I go through this path, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm starting at a point a little bit away. I'm getting closer, closer. If I needed to, I could go to within a ten thousandth, hundred thousandth, however many steps I had to take to illustrate what's happening. So this represents, these three values here represent a right-hand limit. I'm approaching one from the right-hand side uh, for this function f of x. You know, this guy here, this is our f of x now. Okay. okay. Now I'm going to uh, produce a path on the left-hand side in the exact same way. I'm going to choose a point here, a tenth of a unit away from my limit point. What point is a tenth of a unit from one? Point 
Okay? Now I'm going to move within a hundredth of a unit. 0.99. Now I'm going to move within a thousandth of a unit. 0.999. There. There's a pathway along the left-hand side, starting from a point a little bit away, getting closer and closer. And if I wanted to take this even further, 0.9999. 9999999. Bunch of nines together. So here's a pathway. And again, the order of this path is significant. I start from a point furthest away and I move progressively to points closer. So this pathway here represents the limit as x approaches 1 from the left hand side of this function. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of these points in succession and use them in the function and figure out what is this equal to. Now, this is a complicated function. I'm dealing with decimal numbers here. This is a very complex series of computations that I'm being asked to do. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let my calculator do this for me. So, if you weren't here for last time, I told you got to have one of these. Um, you're not going to be able to do this, but I mean, you can do it by hand, but it is so tedious that it's going to, it would take probably longer than a test to, to complete this, efficiently at least. So uh, uh, if you don't have your TIE4s or if you don't, uh, so where are you guys? Do you have one of these? No. Right. But it's a TIE4. Mm -hmm. You have one of these? Four. Oh, I know you have one. Yeah. Okay, so I, I've got to, you know, I, you can't do it here today in class, but I, here, here's, the, here's the setup for all of this. Um, so, um, uh, if you don't have your calculator today with you, that's okay. Uh, but, you know, start bringing it to class because we'll, we'll be doing various things uh, that require them. And by the way, not just graphing, right? We're not going to use this calculator. This is not a graphing problem here. Uh, we don't use these just for graphing. Uh, there's all kind of things that these. Uh, uh, it's a very powerful tool, actually. It's probably even, even better than, the, 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 than a computer. Right? They're simpler to use. They're portable. Okay, anyway, here's the setup. Uh, number one, uh, you've got, uh, we're, we're going to set up a table here to compute these values for us. And so what we need to do is go into our uh, table setup and tell it that we want to uh, have the uh, uh, values of our independent variable uh, entered manually. So the table setup is um, the second key above the window key. So if you hit the second key here, and then hit your window key, uh, that will take you to the table setup page. What you want to do is go here, where it says independent, and change that to ask. So I think the default setting, both of those uh, independent and dependent both say auto. What you want to do, move your cursor down to where it says ask, hit enter, and set that as the, as the parameter. Once you've done that, you'll never have to do it again, right? unless you go back and change it for some reason. Okay, okay once you've uh, got your table set up in the right way, the next thing you do is you enter your function into your calculator under your function screen. So um, uh, here's our function screen, right? Y equals, that's our function screen. And then enter this function in the calculator. And this is, you know, uh, uh, for, you guys, for you new guys, I know guys that I've had before all know this. Uh, anytime you enter a function into the calculator that involves fractional values, especially if there's multiple values in either part of the fraction, you always have to put parentheses around them. So in my calculator, this function, the numerator in parentheses divided by the denominator in parentheses. If you don't include the parentheses, then the order of operations is mis misidentified. You won't get the right answer. And uh, so there's, there's the setup. Make sure you've got your uh, table set for manual entry and make sure your function has been entered. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my calculator and I'm going to start entering these values. So here's my approach from the left-hand side. Uh, I'm going to go to oh, my table. Uh, the table is the second key above the graph key. So I, didn't, I don't have my picture of my calculator here. But the table is the second key above. Let me see if I can get one down here. Yeah, it's going to be too small. That's okay. So the uh, if you hit the second key and then uh, hit the uh, 
graph key. That takes you to your table. It should be empty when you first enter there. Uh, what you do is in the X column, just enter your sequence of values for your left-hand approach. So 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999. In fact, I even went further. I took it all the way down to 0.999. So this sequence here represents my approach from the left. And now we'll look at what's happening. What's happening to my function values as the values of the independent variable approach 1? Well, what did I start at? I started at a 1.5111, then I got 1.65, 1.665, 1.6665. looks like things are starting to settle down. The closer, I, in fact, as those, if I looked at those uh, matching valuations, I can see that once I got to that second step, the first decimal didn't change, the second step, the second decimal got fixed. It looks like this thing is starting to settle down to a specific value. And here's my approach from the left. I'm sorry, from the right. 1.1, 1.01, from a tenth to a hundredth to a thousandth to a ten thousandth. And once again, uh, uh, this is uh, from the right. Once again, I'm looking what's happening to my function values. Now it looks like things are going in the opposite direction. From the left, these values are rising and getting closer and closer to 1.666. From this side, I'm starting a little bit above. My highest value was at 1.84. Now, every time I get closer to 1, I'm getting close. I see the sequence of 6s popping out again. If I look at what's in between here, right, that's where I'm looking for my limit value. It looks like from the top, uh, coming from below as it coming from the left hand side, coming from above as it coming from the right hand side, it looks like these values are starting to sandwich in between that sequence of sixes. So, what do you think this is going to end up being equal to? I don't know, maybe it's just something like this. Certainly up to, you know, by the time I get to the uh, uh, ten thousandth of a unit away, uh, one point, uh, somewhere in between 1.6, uh, in fact, yeah, let's say that for sure. Because, and this is why we have to look at this as a process. Because I'm really not sure exactly what's going to happen as I close in on this valuation. <coughs> but I can see that from the left, the closer I get, these function values are starting to settle down. From the right, the closer I get, these functions are starting to settle down. And, not only that, but they seem to be approaching each other. And what I can conclude from this setup is that the actual limit value must be somewhere between these two boundaries. That's what I can conclude. Um, an educated guess what that value might be. Um, well, uh, I'm going to guess that that's going to be end up being equal to uh, I don't know uh, maybe five thirds, right? Looks like five thirds is being squeezed in between those two pathways. So that's my guess. Um, and of course, it, when I go back and look at the original function. What do I see? Five thirds. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so there you go. But in the long run, this is still just a guess. I really can't uh, be sure that as I get even closer, things might start to go haywire. You know, at this point, it surely appears that I've got some very well behaved valuations coming in here and that whichever direction I approach, every time I get closer, I'm getting closer and closer to five-thirds. So that's going to be my guess. But again, uh, I can't be absolutely certain that it's exactly five-thirds or that something might go terribly wrong as I got down inside here and uh, this whole process breaks down. Um, but that's an, uh, a tabular approach to solving this problem. And the, uh, you know, once you've got your calculator set up to accomplish this, the, really, the only really part of the analysis that you're going to be responsible for is picking these paths, making sure that you can pick the right approach from the two directions.
closing in, starting from a point. And again, this is the typical routine, starting from a tenth of a way and then a factor of ten every step closer, left and right. If you can produce those two pathways, then typically you'll actually be able to see uh, whether these values are settling down and what value they might actually be approaching. So here's a tabular method. If all else breaks down, and we will see cases in which uh, there really is no alternative. We're going to see limit, well, I shouldn't say that. might not be in this class, but if you're going to take the calculus sequence, you will run across examples of where this estimation process is really all we have to go by because the algebraic methods uh, turn out to be insufficient. So this is a good tool to have, and it's a good way to check yourself if you're so inclined to do that. Um, uh, here's another example. I'm only showing this example for one reason. Uh, because I want you to do this right now. For you guys that don't have your calculators, please do this as soon as you get home. Um, here's the limit uh, of a function value. Uh, sorry, of one of our trigonometric functions involving a trig function. Uh, I want to know the limit as x approaches zero of this, sine x over x. By the way, uh, by direct substitution, what is this equal to? It's undefined. Oh, but by the way, what is sine of zero? No, sine of zero? Zero. zero. So once again, by direct substitution, uh, and it really doesn't matter what sine of zero is, that zero in the denominator tells me this is undefined. So uh, this is another case where direct substitution fails. Okay, what I want you to make sure you do, though, is set your calculator to radian mode. Because in uh, calculus and in algebra in general, um, the uh, trigonometric values are always expressed uh, through the radian measure. So uh, in your calculator, get your, um, uh, I don't have my calculator here. Uh, where is it? It's the um, mode key. Right, here's your mode key right here. Mode key, go to this screen. Make sure on this row you've got your calculator set to radian measure. If you do it now, you won't have to do it again for the rest of the semester, but your calculator has to recognize that we're evaluating these trigonometric functions, not in degrees, but in radians. And then I did the same thing here. So here's a picture of the result of that um, evaluation. Uh, here's my function, sine x over x. Plug that in. Uh, the approach that I took in this case, right, here's my zero. So uh, the two pathways starting from one-tenth of a unit away, one-hundredth, one-thousandth. On the other side, minus one-tenth, minus one-hundredth, minus one-thousandth. Okay. And there's my right inside there, right? Here's my left-hand approach here. Here's my right-hand approach here. What do you think the limit of this is equal to? You've had to guess based on this result. What would your guess be? One. One. In fact, this has settled down so quickly uh, that uh, there's no variation between the two paths. From left and right, by the time I'm a thousandth of a unit away, I've generated the exact same value. It, and of course, it turns out that's exactly right. This limit is equal to one. Uh, and it converges so quickly that uh, once you get beyond a thousandth of a unit, you won't get any variation here at all. Um, how are we doing? Yeah, let's, let me see, what do I have left here? Oh, and finally, uh, I want to show this. Uh, here's one more example that involves one of our trigonometric functions. Here's where things can go wrong. Uh, I'm looking, I want to evaluate this limit here, uh, cosine of 1 over x, okay? And once again, this is undefined, right? If I try and plug in 0 for the variable, I get an undefined quantity. Uh, so the uh, limit, the direct substitution fails. Uh, and so I'm going to do the same thing I just did. I'm going to um, uh, enter my function into the calculator. I'm going to take my two paths along the left and right hand approaches. So very similar to what I just did. Negative 0.1, negative 0 0.01, right? <coughs> That's my left hand approach. <coughs> On this other screen I've got my right hand approach. What happens when I look at the behavior of the function values? Well, they're kind of all over the place. 
And this is something that you can't see unless you put this together as a process, unless you look at this step by step at what's happening. Uh, I've got a negative number here, all of a sudden it becomes positive, it's positive again, then it becomes negative. They're jumping all around. It's not settling down to anything. And of course, since cosine is an even function, the same thing's happening on the other side. So uh, here, I don't see the limit behavior being satisfied. When I look at what happened here, every time I got closer, I could see these values getting closer and closer, starting to settle down. Same thing for my sine function here. The closer I got to the limit value, the closer these values got to 1. They were always getting closer as I, got, <coughs> as I went along. <coughs> but here, I don't see that. I just see some kind of random, right? jumping up, down, positive, negative, nothing settling down. And so here's an example of a function whose limit fails to exist, right? These function values are not closing in on any particular valuation. They seem to be randomly distributed in a sense. So here's an example in which the conclusion is that the limit doesn't exist. Now, if the only thing you looked at were these values. If you said, well, let me just look at the very closest two values and see what I get. Well, you got the same thing. You might be tempted to say, well, that must be the limit value. I'm this close. I've got my function sandwiched in between these two values. They turn out to be the same. That looks like it might be the limit value. Well, you, have, you fail to consider the limit as a process. You've just looked at the closest points, but you haven't observed whether that process of getting closer to the limit point actually forces these valuations to become settled. And that's not what I see in this table. So if you are using a table tabular method, it does take a sequence of points to establish the existence of the limit. And if you don't see the behavior of, uh, of uh, that value being approached, or each valuation getting closer and closer to some number, the conclusion is that this limit fails. Uh, so what, what's going on here? Um, Here's a graph of the cosine fun of this function. So this is what this graph looks like. What's happening? Well, as x gets closer to 0, 1 over x is going to infinity. And so the, fun the, uh, uh, the cosine function is running through all of its cycles more and more quickly. That's what's happening is x, as the argument gets large and la larger and larger, the cosine function is just running through all of its cycles, up and down, up and down, endlessly, more and more quickly. It's not settling down, it's, continually, it's continuing to run through its cycles. And that's why this limit fails. Because the function is not getting closer to any one thing, it's just bouncing up and down as the uh, function runs through its domain. As we go towards zero and this these values uh, increase without bound, the cosine function continues to cycle through its uh, periods more and more frequently and never settling down to any single value. That's what this table shows me. This table shows me that kind of random distribution of these points as the cosine function cycles through its periods. Okay, so there's a tabular method to identify limit values. Um, uh, but this last count example is Im so important because of the fact that this does show you that it's not enough just to look at the closest points. You've got to look at the process. Is this starting to settle down? No, this is not settling down, just bouncing around. Okay. <coughs> uh, so, there's our, so we looked at uh, the uh, limit geometrically. Here's a tabular method to observe limit behavior. Uh, we'll finish today by looking at uh, some algebraic methods, um, but uh, now it's time for our break. So.